and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, for part three of our series on integrated pest management, or IPM, we'll be talking about preserving the pest control toolkit with Dr. Brian Ulmer. IPM is a system by which pests are controlled using informed decision-making techniques. These techniques are many and varied, but so are the threats to their continued use. This episode, Brian will walk us through the types of tools in the IPM toolkit, the kinds of threats they face, and how we can protect these valuable pest management resources. Thank you to Kellogg Company for sponsoring this episode. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show today. Today, we have Brian Ulmer with us. Brian grew up farming small grains in Western Canada before completing a PhD at the University of Saskatchewan on plant-based resistance to insect pests. He then went on to a postdoc at the University of Alberta working on integrated pest management, or IPM, and followed that with a postdoc at the University of Florida researching biological controls of introduced crop pests. For the last 15 years, Brian has been working as a scientist for Syngenta, first in the U.S., focused primarily on crop protection and broad acre crops, then in Switzerland as a global technical manager, before returning to Canada with the cereals breeding program. In his current role as the global technical lead for the value chain, Brian is collaborating with food companies and the industry to support quality and production gains while delivering on sustainability targets. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Abby. Glad to be here. Great. We are so happy to have you. Um, and obviously, we're, we're glad to have you in general as a guest, but also this is kind of a special thing for our show because you are, in fact, our first guest who is from industry. So for people who are not from an ag background, can you just kind of explain what industry means as a term in relation to agriculture, kind of what it is and what it does? Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about research, we often talk about the public and private sector. So industry would essentially be uh, private sector and public sector research from government agencies or universities tends to be a little bit more visible and published. But, you know, there's a tremendous amount of research done in the private sector, which may or may not be as visible, but uh, significantly contributes to advancements uh, in sustainable agriculture. I think one of the one of the really great things about the agricultural community is the collaboration between the the public sector and industry researchers. So, you know, when we talk about a topic like IPM, the research efforts are really quite complementary in that there's a lot of work going on in the public sector around overall cropping systems, integrated approaches, uh, agroecology. Uh, these types of things, while industry is putting significant resources into developing new solutions that will support IPM programs. And, you know, that can be things like traditional crop protection, uh, but there's also a lot going on in other areas. So uh, biologicals, digital agriculture, are a couple of great examples of areas where I think we can expect a lot of new technologies that will complement the existing tools that we have for uh, IPM solutions in the future. And really at the end of the day, uh, we've got a lot of great science coming from both the public and private sectors and you know everyone's pulling in the same direction towards more sustainable agricultural practices and i think we can be really optimistic about uh, continued improvements including uh, support for integrated pest management great uh that's a wonderful overview we are always happy to hear about collaboration so thank you for all of the work that you do and to all of our other researchers and uh, public sector folks who are listening as well. Um, so today, as we've alluded to, uh, we are talking about IPM and specifically the IPM toolkit. So can you kind of talk about this general concept of the IPM toolkit and what that's all about? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I know you guys have had a couple discussions around IPM already, so I won't get too much into that. But I mean, essentially... Uh, IPM is about overall farm management and not necessarily a single or simple solution to a specific issue. So it's really a holistic approach that considers all farming practices to help discourage uh, the development of economically significant pest populations. And of course, keeping in mind, uh, minimizing risk to human health and, and the environment. So uh, crop protection products are certainly a part of that. Um, 
you know, and if they need to be implemented, uh, when we do approach economic thresholds, we need to make sure that we steward that properly, um, but also, you know, maintain these tools for growers. So in practice, you know, IPM is really a continuum and everyone that's farming is already practicing IPM at some level on that continuum. But of course, there's always opportunities for improvement, uh, you know, on each and every farm. So when we talk about the IPM toolkit analogy, we really need to keep as many tools in the toolbox as we can to combat agricultural pests. So basically, the more tools we have to work with, the better chance we'll have of providing a solution to a given uh, pest threat. And, you know, a lot of this comes down to diversity of tactics. So combining multiple tools that have an effect on the same pest is really the best way to maintain the longevity of the tools that we have. Because as soon as we start to rely too much on any one tool, we're really doomed to eventually lose that tool uh, from our toolbox. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, takes a lot of tools to build a house and also run a farm and any other kind of project you could have. So... Um, to get a little more specific here, can you talk about what are some of the, if you had to, uh, kind of lay out your toolbox, uh, to a grower or, or whoever you're speaking to, what, what are the specific tools, um, that you see within the general toolbox? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's going to be some basic principles of IPM that are going to apply to every farm. Uh, and there's obviously tools within those. So things like pest identification are really the foundation of IPM, uh, proper scouting and monitoring, developing and understanding economic thresholds. Um, and I think we don't have to worry too much about losing tools in this space, but I think we can be optimistic about improving tools. So when you think about things like scouting and monitoring and the advancements in digital agriculture uh, that we can maybe talk a little bit more about later, I think there's you know reason to be pretty excited about things going on there. Um, economic thresholds, you know, these are going to be developed as commodity prices change, input costs change, but essentially the principles remain the same. The tools that we'll talk more about today are things like um, cultural practices, so, you know, rotations, uh, planting specs, so timing, density, depth, the type of things that will, uh, you know, help with early plant establishment, uh, competitiveness of your crop, those types of things. Tillage would be another tool that would fit under, you know, cultural practices. Another big bucket would be things like biological controls. So this would include uh, like natural enemies, uh, biocontrols that are introduced or biostimulants that are introduced into the system by farmers. Of course, chemical controls are also part of an IPM system. So, you know, anything that you're using for crop protection. Genetics are another big component. Uh, you can think about this in terms of traditional plant breeding or GMOs. Uh, there's also new technologies that are coming, you know, in terms of things like predictive breeding and, and CRISPR and some of these other areas. Um, and another one that isn't always talked about, but I think is really important, uh, relates back to chemical controls and to some extent biocontrols, but application technology, I think, is something that maybe we can touch on. And then a new uh, tool in this space, you know, really over the last number of years is digital agriculture, uh, precision ag. So those are kind of the main uh, big buckets of tools that we're thinking about. Sure, absolutely. Um yeah, what a what a wide array. Um, but one of the things we wanted to focus on today is not just the tools themselves, lovely as they are, um, but kind of some of the um, threats that exist when talking about these tools, um, which you kind of alluded to before. So you had mentioned in uh, prep for this that there's kind of two main threats that exist for any number of these tools. Um, so could you tell me what are the main two threats and then as well uh, how that kind of manifests for some of these specific tools we're talking about? Yeah, thanks, Abby. I think when we talk about the threats, really it comes down to two things. Number one is uh, the tool stops working as well, and the other way would be to simply lose the tool. So uh, when we talk about tools that stop working, I think resistance is a perfect example uh, we're dealing with pest resistance on many fronts. You can talk about crop protection products, uh, genetic traits, even some cultural practices where pests have overcome control measures. Uh, but herbicide resistance has probably become top of mind for most growers. Uh, herbicides have been one of the most important tools for production increases over the last few decades. I mean, they're effective and easy to use, which has essentially led to overuse. And as we discussed earlier, you know, whenever you rely too much on any one control tactic, 
uh, eventually we're going to run into problems. But weed resistance is also, you know, a nice example of how we can change tactics and use a more integrated approach to try to preserve those herbicide tools that we have. Um, things like use recommendations around full rates and using multiple modes of action are, you know, fundamental to resistance management. But introducing other tactics like tillage or cover crops is starting to gain more traction. Uh, we're also seeing growers look at diversifying rotations to support weed management or uh, experimenting with things like row spacing or planting rates to try and develop a more competitive plant stand. I think we're starting to think more about controlling weed escapes to manage seed banks uh, and also in some areas you know they're even looking at weed seed destructors as part of harvest equipment. So these are all tools that can help reduce the reliance on herbicides and the bottom line is really that we have to take a more integrated approach to maintain the herbicide tools we have. You know, the last uh, commercially relevant mode of action was brought to market over three decades ago. So there's no guarantee that new chemistry is going to come along to provide a solution. And we really need to take, take care of the chemistries that we have available to us today. Um, you know, we need effective herbicides, not just to maintain production, but if you think about other, some of the other sustainability um, initiatives, things like cover crop management or reduced tillage for soil health, we also need effective herbicides to move in those directions. Uh, and all these things are connected as we develop farm management plans. And to shift gears a little bit away from resistance, you know, a much different example of tools that maybe aren't working as well could be things like natural enemies. And I'm thinking about insect predators and parasitoids which can play a really important role in keeping pest insects below threshold. Now, natural enemies are probably not going to control a pest outbreak once it occurs, but they're always in the background providing some pest suppression and can help delay or prevent pests from reaching economic threshold. Uh, you know, good examples are species that have multiple generations. And, you know, you think about something like aphids and how they reproduce and multiply throughout the season. And if you can have some suppression by natural enemies early in the season when numbers are low, that can have a measurable impact on the progression of an outbreak uh, to potentially delay the need for uh, intervention with insecticides or even remove the need for an application or you know, maybe instead of two applications, you only need one. So I think in many cases, you know, people would be surprised at the amount of pest mortality that's occurring from disease and natural enemies. And, you know, when we go back to where we started and talk about things like monitoring, that's why we talk about monitoring not only uh, the pests that we're concerned with, but also looking at beneficials when we're making decisions about an application. I think the other thing when we talk about beneficials and natural enemies uh, is to focus on habitat loss, which is likely the biggest concern. And there's really no simple answer for this, you know, likely the first step is to start to look at areas like field margins or wetlands or bluffs of trees as reservoirs for biodiversity and, and not just necessarily as wasted land, uh, which should be brought into production if it can. Uh, the next step, of course, would be to try and reclaim some cultivated land back to a more natural state. And now, you know, farmers are connected to the land and, and generally some of the most concerned about nature they know the wildlife on their farms and they protect it uh, but i don't think we can expect farmers to take land out of production uh, they're relying on their land base for their livelihood so if this is a direction that society wants to go i think we would have to find ways to support growers in doing this and there are some programs out there i mean our organization has one called operation pollinator which encourages uh, multifunctional field margins with mixtures of plants that support pollinators, but of course also overall biodiversity. And you know there may be programs in your area that you could look into if you're interested in something like this. So I think those are a couple you know different examples of threats that could lead to tools not working as well. When we think about tools that are taken away, it could be you know in the literal sense like an active ingredient being regulated out of use, and we do have pressure on various different crop protection tools, uh, though maybe not as much as some other geographies. But all the stewardship uh, and best practices we talk about with IPM that help reduce the environmental impact of crop protection products also helps support keeping those products in the market and available to growers. Uh, losing tools, you know, could also be less black and white than having something completely taken away. So the tillage example could apply here, you know, as we promote soil health and we shift away from tillage, it's a tool that potentially becomes less available in some systems. Or you could think about things like a lack of investment in plant breeding, which could limit genetic advancements uh, for pest tolerance and maybe minor crops are more at risk for something like this. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about genetics today, but continuing to improve on crop genetics is really at the heart of, of uh, IPM. 
I think cultural practices can also be impacted. So, you know, profitable rotation options uh, might be limited by things like infrastructure or marketing opportunities or even the need for new equipment. So we may know that there's lots of benefits to more diverse crop rotations, uh, things like interrupting disease or nematode cycles or improving biodiversity or soil health, but it's not always practical to implement. So, you know, I think you only need to look at all the acres that are in a corn soy rotation and for good reason, uh, and then think about all the moving parts that would be required to profitably diversify that rotation. So, um, you know, these are just some of the things we could talk about um, many other areas where all these tools may not be available to all the different growers. Uh, there's lots of different factors here and they're all complicated by different things and you know, not the least of which is economics. But I think before we leave the discussion on uh, threats to IPM tools, I do want to touch on the importance of proper application, uh, especially for preserving crop protection tools. So as a rule of thumb, about 50% of the performance you can expect from a product is intrinsic to the product you're using. So, you know, the AI itself, the formulation, the quality of the product, but the other half of performance really comes from properly applying it, uh, both in terms of efficacy, but also off target impacts, uh, environmental impacts. And in North America, I think we do a relatively good job of this, but there's always room for some improvement. So making good decisions about things like nozzles, uh, spray timing, mixing order, water volume, all the things that go into a proper application, boom height, wind speed, all these, getting all these things right is going to maximize efficacy. Um, and that can prevent the need for extra applications, uh, can also reduce the risk for resistance development. So, you know, it's really helping to maintain the effectiveness of the tools that we have. On the other side, Proper applications also avoid off-target impacts and reduce the chances of, you know, damage to off-target crops or natural areas, uh, potential contamination of soil or water. So stewardship in these areas can really help reduce the risk that crop protection tools will be regulated out because, you know, one of the main reasons why things are regulated out of use is environmental impacts. So if we can minimize those risks, we can help keep these tools available uh, to growers in the future. And of course, things like proper tank cleanout, waste disposal, container management, all this is important to minimizing uh, environmental impacts. All these things around best management practices and proper applications are also going to save time and money for the grower. Uh, they're going to reduce the risks of phytotoxicity or residues in crops. So, you know, again, there are benefits not just for IPM, but for overall farm management when we talk about making proper applications. <music> everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? The American Society of Agronomy and Certified Crop Advisor Program are hosting five IPM webinars between December 2020 and May 2021 to coincide with this mini-series. The American Society of Agronomy's magazine, Crops and Soils, will also be publishing three articles on related IPM topics, including one by Brian about IPM toolkit preservation. If you'd like to learn more about any of these resources or related continuing education unit opportunities, you'll find links to them in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can also take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode and Brian's article, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great overview of a lot of the uh, kind of specific ways that these two threats manifest themselves in uh, going after the tools in the toolkit. Um, and and something that you kind of touched on uh, when you're talking about the herbicide resistance specifically was kind of like we can help uh, mitigate some of these issues by, you know, using multiple tools so we're not relying on any one thing too much. Um, but there's something else that uh, you had brought up to me in preparation for this that I wanted to touch on, which was related to this balance, is really taking um, the importance of taking a holistic approach and to kind of extend the analogy for a toolkit, um, you know, you might not need a measuring cup for building a house, but maybe you need it for a baking project, you know, like there's, and and to take that to an ag perspective, you know, maybe there's something that you need for 
regenerative egg that you don't need for IPM or, you know, any other kind of project that is available uh, for growers. So could you talk to me about kind of how how to wisely manage these tools in a broader scope that is not just taking IPM into approach, but kind of the whole farming system uh, as, as a whole. Yeah, I think for the most part, you know, across the industry, we're all on the same page when we talk about, um, you know, diversity of tactics and keeping tools in the toolbox. So, you know, no one will dispute that genetic diversity is beneficial or that, you know, proper pest ID is critical to IPM. Um, diversity of pest management taxes is central to all topics related to sustainable agriculture, whether it's IPM or regenerative ag or any of the other initiatives. But I think there are always some exceptions uh, and there are some tools that we might be sending mixed messages on. So as an industry, I think we also need to avoid working in silos and we really have to look at the best available solutions to support sustainable agriculture and be thinking about IPM and regenerative ag and all these other different initiatives in a holistic manner. So, you know, I'll give you a couple examples, um, you know, Regenerative ag has become a very fashionable term and there's a slightly different definitions of regenerative ag with different organizations, but you know, the real underlying principle is around soil health, maintaining continuous cover, uh, increasing organic matter, reducing soil disturbance. So tillage is something that's really discouraged in regenerative ag uh, to minimize soil disturbance. So when we think about IPM, and we think about the discussion we just had about weed management, you know, tillage can be quite an important tool in terms of um, resistance management and controlling weeds. So, you know, these two things are a little bit in conflict. Uh, another good example, you know, again, speaking about regenerative ag and IPM, one of the principles of IPM is, you know, to really understand your pest populations and know that you're reaching economic threshold before you implement chemical controls. So an example would be seed treatments where this would not necessarily be uh, right in line with an IPM principle because it's basically a preventative control measure. But at the same time, when we think about regenerative agriculture, uh, we're, we're introducing a layer of crop residue and organic material that is you know, a huge reservoir for disease inoculum. We're also keeping soil temperatures cooler and moister. So you know, this is an ideal condition for uh, plant diseases and seed treatments can be really beneficial in terms of maintaining plant health, early stand establishment, uh, competitive um, crop. So there's lots of great sustainability messages around seed treatments, but they don't necessarily fit in with an IPM approach. So, you know, I think we just have to keep these things in mind and realize that there's no perfect solutions um, that support every aspect of every uh, sustainability initiative but we should strive to do the best that we can with the tools that are available today, you know, and as we move forward, we may come with new or better technologies that could replace something like tillage. Uh, but right now today with the toolbox that we have, it's still potentially an important piece, you know, for some aspects of sustainable ag. So those are some of the things I was thinking about is just to make sure that we're taking a holistic approach and not just talking about what's right for IPM or what's right for soil conservation, but recognizing, you know, the value of different practices uh, depending on your individual situation on your farm. Yeah. Um, I, I love that because I really, I'm always fascinated by kind of the wisdom that is involved in farming and, and the balances that people have to strike um, and, and just what a, uh, how everything is kind of interconnected is is always really interesting to me. So um, as far as kind of taking that holistic approach goes, like, do you find that they're like, wh how can farmers better make those decisions? Like, is it just whatever their personal focus is on? Is it, I mean, obviously, there's always going to be kind of that economic um, factor of like what they're able to do with what they uh, the means they have but is it like go talk to a certified crop advisor about it is it go to extension or some other resource to get more advice like how do how do you feel that those decisions are or maybe uh, can wisely be made 
Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to on-farm experience. So, you know, every operation is different. Uh, a lot of these things will have been experimented with in the past. Uh, a lot of growers will know what works on their farm, their soil type, with their weed spectrum or their pest infestations uh, from the experiences they've had. But the other piece is to keep up on, you know, what is happening in the research community and, you know, talk to your local extension agronomist, uh, talk to your uh, crop protection representative, there's lots of resources to understand what's coming and what's new. Uh, be open to experimenting on your farm. Try different things. You know, try it on a small area and, and make sure that you're comparing it to uh, other parts of your operation and keep records and just understand what's working and what's not. And we have to recognize also that every year and every situation is going to be different. So when we talk about pest control, you know, often the environment is about 80% of the equation. So we're going to get thrown different things every single season. Uh, and there's no perfect solution uh, for pest management. It's, it's really about playing the odds, managing your risks, you know, and doing as many of the right things you can at the right time. Yeah, great, great advice. Um, and go farmers, I will say it <laughs> as many times as it comes up. I am just so always impressed um by growers and just their their level of expertise to execute what they do <laughs> is astonishing to me in face of all of the things that they uh encounter in running their operations uh so good job to them as always um and i think that um kind of brings us to speaking of of uh ongoing research our next question which is uh as far as future research goes for these kinds of things, like where are we going? How can we, you know, whether that's in protecting the the uh, tools that we already have or developing new tools or improving the ones that we have, like where are we going with the toolkit? Yeah, I mean, we've talked a little bit today about protecting the tools that we have in the toolkit, and that is certainly uh, going to be extremely important moving forward. But I think there's a lot of reason for optimism, um, you know, based on the research that's going on right now. Some of the areas that will really be key, I think a big one's going to be the digital space. So we're seeing rapid advancements, you know, in things like data management, uh, crop Im imagery, pest forecasting and identification. All of these things are moving at a very rapid pace and they're all areas that could significantly impact uh, integrated pest management. So we're going to see a lot of new innovation coming there. I think formulation technology is another area where we continue to see improvements. So, you know, we're seeing formulations that are safer for the environment, uh, more efficacious, and these all can contribute to not only reducing the environmental impact, but, you know, maintaining the efficacy uh, of tools moving forward. And when you combine those two things, you know, in terms of formulation and digital agriculture, uh, and you look at things like precision agriculture, so, you know, essentially, maybe not broadcasting an application over the entire field, but focusing very specifically on areas where you might have uh, pest infestations and kind of nipping them in the bud or targeting problem areas of a field, you know, formulation, satellite imagery, all these different technologies are going to come together to help us um, be more precise with the applications that we're making, which of course will induce, reduce the environmental load of the products we're using and, and help us keep those in the, in the toolbox for growers for longer. I think there's also significant advancements in genetics and breeding that are going to bring a lot of advantages moving forward. So uh, you think about things like predictive breeding, new technologies like CRISPR. These are all increasing the speed that genetic advancements can be brought, um, you know, to growers. And there's great things going on across all different crops in that space. On the crop protection side, the products that are coming to market now, you know, are meeting ever increasing environmental standards and we're seeing significant investment in biologicals as well. So, you know, biologicals are something that have always been involved in integrated pest management. And we've certainly seen, you know, successes often on more intensively managed uh, smaller acre uh, operations or greenhouses. You know, biologicals have been very important for a number of years, but they've never really been a big part of pest management in large scale broad acre agriculture. And I think that, you know, moving forward, that's going to change. We're seeing more investment in this space. We're seeing uh, more efficacy coming out of the products that are being developed. They're making them more competitive with synthetics 
Yeah, and can, just for uh, people who don't have an ag background, like myself, uh, can you explain what a biological is? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about biologicals, we often break it into two categories. So one would be biocontrols, and one would be biostimulants. And basically, uh, biocontrols are products that are based on naturally occurring materials that are used for biotic stress management. So, you know, controlling things like fungal and infections, uh, bacterial diseases, insects, nematodes, weeds, uh, these types of biotic stresses to crops. So, you know, there's different examples of biocontrol. So one would be uh, semiochemicals or pheromones. Uh, we can talk about microbials. We can talk about uh, parasitic or predatory insects. Uh, and of course, natural substances that may be derived from plants or, or different parts of nature that will help control uh, biotic pests. The other one, biostimulants, is essentially, you know, any substance that is applied to plants, seeds, or, or the roots with the intention to stimulate natural processes of the plants, which uh, may benefit nutrient use efficiency or help tolerate abiotic stress or improve crop quality. So, you know, examples of this would be uh, products that help with um, things like drought stress or moisture stress, uh, maybe help with deficiencies in the soil. So soil salinity, uh, they could improve different aspects of crop quality or potentially nutrient efficiency. Uh, so all of those things that would contribute to plant health. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so did you have any other thoughts on future research? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, the bottom line is that there's lots of opportunities to add to the toolbox. So if we can maintain the tools that we have and bring some of these new uh, innovations to growers, the future is really, you know, bright for a more integrated and sustainable approach to pest management. So I think there's really a lot of um, room for optimism in this space, and we can expect great things over the next number of years. Wonderful. Always, always uh, happy to be on an optimistic note. Um, to that end, I have three questions left for you. Uh, the first one is where people can learn more. I will say, uh, first off, as a lead in, we do have the rest of the IPM series with the webinars, as well as uh, the next couple episodes on the podcast here for IPM and the last two that we released. Uh, so we will have links to all of that in the show notes. But where else can people go for more information? I think there's a lot more discussion around IPM, and I expect that it will uh, continue to increase moving forward as we focus more on sustainable agriculture. Uh, you know, a great resource for IPM and sustainable agriculture in general is your local agronomy extension uh, team. That's where I would start with. There's lots of uh, resources that you can look at online. Uh, there's lots of great material on integrated pest management from CropLife International. They've got training modules and things like that as well. Uh, when we talk about things like uh, resistance management, you know, the Herbicide Resistance Action Committee or HRAC uh, for weed management, IRAC, which is insecticides, uh, FRAC, which is fungicides. So these are all great resources in terms of uh, managing resistance. And there's many other places that you can go and, you know, we can see if we can dig out a few more to include in the show notes afterwards, Abby. Great. Yeah, that would be wonderful. We will for sure be including links to all of the things. Um, and there are, of course, uh, plenty of IPM related uh, educational resources on the society's uh, certified crop advisor program sites and uh, news stories and all that kind of stuff. So we will have links to those. Um, second question is then if people want to get involved with any of the things we've discussed today, how can they do that? Yeah, I think as, you know, agronomists or growers, we're in a great position, you know, like we talked about earlier, everybody is already practicing IPM at some level, it's it's more of a continuum. Uh, so really in a great spot to hit the ground running in anyone's operation. Um, you know, there's always ways that you can improve. So, you know, I just say keep an eye on the research that's being done, the new tools that are coming to market. And like we talked a little bit about before, just be willing to experiment on your farm. I mean, every operation is different. Some things are going to work better for some growers, uh, depending on your soil type, your crop rotation, all these different things. Uh, so we just want to make sure that we're trying new things when we do 
um, do that, we want to make sure we're comparing, you know, the new tactics with what we're already doing on our farm. So, you know, keep good records, do it on small chunks, make specific changes and see really what's working and what's um, not going to work for you. But I think, you know, everyone's in a good starting position um, to keep improving in, in, in this area of IPM. For listeners that may not be directly involved in agriculture, you know, I just encourage you to make a point of understanding agriculture. If you get the chance to get on a farm uh, and appreciate how much goes into food production and the efforts farmers are making uh, to grow crops more sustainably, uh, you know, please go ahead and do that. Uh, you can also practice IPM principles with your lawn or garden. I mean, as homeowners, we tend to overdo things like fertilizer, or pest control measures, and urban areas do contribute to the environmental concerns. So, you know, there are things that we can all do to try and reduce our footprint. Great. That is wonderful advice. Uh, get involved if you want, people. That would be great. Um Final question for you is what is one fun fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? Well, we've got a couple of teenage girls, so they keep us pretty busy, you know, with sports and things like that. Um, traveling has also been something that has been a real passion for our family. I, my wife is extremely adventurous and she's encouraged many moves over the last number of years, which have given us the opportunity to explore, you know, a lot of the world. Um, the other one probably is I like to get outside as much as I can. It used to be more about sports, uh, but now as I'm getting a little bit older, it seems to be more about things like fishing or maybe carving and things like that. But, uh, yeah, we just try to keep busy, uh, and en enjoy the natural world. Yeah. And what a great world it is. Um, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your expertise. Uh, thanks for being on. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was great. Thanks, Abby. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. This podcast is sponsored by the Kellogg Company. Kellogg is committed to reach 1 million farmers and workers globally by the end of 2030 with programs that support resilient farmers, communities, and ecosystems. The opinions shared on this podcast are independent from our sponsor. You'll find links to today's resources in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcasts if you like our show. We're also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by guests are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.